Welcome to YSB's Chemical Awareness Program. My name is Julia Geigel, and I am a Chemical Health Specialist with the Youth Service Bureau. This virtual presentation is the educational portion of CAP and is to be viewed by the young person and their parent or other caring, identified caring adult. To successfully complete this class, the young person will need to complete the quiz that was emailed to you. The answers to the quiz are in this presentation in the document titled CAP Educational Video and Resources, which is linked under this presentation. You will be asked to share the answers during your follow-up visit with YSB's Chemical Health Specialist. As you know, CAP is a diversion service. The purpose of diversion services is to divert people away from the formal processing of the juvenile justice system, the courts, while also holding them accountable for their decisions and helping them learn from their mistakes. Generally speaking, laws and policies are in, a place, are in place to help people be safe and healthy. So when we break a law, it's a prime opportunity to reflect on why we made that decision, the potential consequences of it, and what our plan is moving forward. You know, generally speaking, our mistakes don't define who we are, but what does define us is what we do with that mistake, how we learn from it, how we come up the other side of it, a better version of ourselves. This class has three main purposes, learn, reflect, grow. This presentation really covers the learn purpose of the class. It's important we have accurate information from credible sources to inform our decisions. There's a lot of misinformation out there that comes from sources such as social media and our friends. Now, credible sources that have health and science-based information come from .edu and .gov websites. Reflection. Reflection is all about self-awareness. Who am I as a person and who do I want to be? If you have used or continue to use substances, including nicotine, reflect on the deeper reasons you use. Are you using to cope with stress? Are you using to get approval from your friends? I mean, what's the use really about? Maybe you're dealing with an underlying mental health issue. And then it's about reflecting on, you know, how does your use impact your mental, emotional, and physical health? How does it affect school? How does it affect family and other relationships? What changes do you want to make? I would invite parents and caring adults to engage in self-reflection as well. Um, parenting is one of the most rewarding and one of the most difficult parts of life. So reflect on your parenting. If your goal is to encourage your child to lead a healthy life and protect them from the negative consequences of substance use, ask your child, how am I doing with that goal? What am I doing that's helpful? What am I doing that's not helpful? I mean, you're the parent and you ultimately decide your expectations and consequences, but engage your child in the process of that. And then growth. Growth is the action step. What are you going to do differently as a result of the reflection? What resources do you need to make the changes you want to make? Well, you will have the opportunity to talk about reflection and growth in the follow-up session with the chemical health specialist. I would invite you to engage in the process of reflection and growth throughout this presentation and beyond. I mean, really, learning, reflecting, and growing is a lifelong process as we continue to strive to be a better version of ourselves. So let's get on to the learning. The, the topics that I will cover are brain development, overview of drugs with more information on e-cigarettes, marijuana, and alcohol, and addiction. This presentation, um, it's about 40 minutes. So one of the primary reasons underage substance use is taken so seriously is that the brain is still growing and developing. In fact, the brain isn't fully developed until about age 25. The last part of the brain to develop is the prefrontal cortex. This part of the brain is the CEO of the brain and in charge of decision making, goal setting, and regulating emotions. It's the brakes of the brain. It's the part of the brain that says, is that really, good, is that really a good idea? The prefrontal cortex has also been compared to the referee of you know, a basketball game. It, it keeps things in check. 
So that's the part of the brain that's the last to develop. So when, when you use during adolescence, that pause button, those decision-making skills, they just don't get developed as well. You know, think of having a crappy referee monitoring the basketball game. Your brain is also going through a pruning process. So the things you do, that connection is kept. And the things you don't do, the behaviors you don't do, that's getting pruned away. So what you choose to do right now is personalizing your brain for adulthood. This is a prime time to nurture the brain connections that will stay with you for the rest of your life. Think of a house being built. The foundation of that house is the most important, the structure of the house, the electrical wiring, the plumbing. That's what's gonna stick with the, the house and that's what builds that foundation. During adolescence, your brain's foundation is built. So this means that any substance use during the teenage years makes you incredibly vulnerable to addiction. Remember, the things you do during adolescence, those are the connections that get hardwired. So 90% of adults with addiction, which is addiction is uh, the medical term is substance use disorder, started using before they were age 18. Now, best case scenario is that you don't use at all. Drugs aren't good for anybody. But if you can delay use, that minimizes your risk of addiction. In fact, delaying use just two years can prevent 1.5 million people in the U.S. from developing an addiction. So delay. Let's move on to an overview of drugs. In this presentation, I use chemical, substance, and drug interchangeably. Drugs are classified into three general categories based on how they impact the central nervous system. Stimulants like cocaine and misuse of Adderall speed up the central nervous system. Depressants like alcohol and opioids decrease the central nervous system, slow it down. And hallucinogens, psychedelics like LSD, acid, psilocybin, sh shrooms, they distort our sense of uh, our senses and perception of reality. It's important to make a distinction between drug versus medication. Drugs are used to feel good, better, or different. It's, they're used for pleasure or to meet a perceived need. Most drugs are illegal, and the ones that aren't have age restrictions. Drugs have significant health risks, and they're dangerous. Medications, on the other hand, they're used for treating a medical condition or managing the symptoms, often prescribed by a medical professional. And if, if the person is prescribed and takes them as prescribed, then it's a medication. Many factors go into that prescription. For instance, Adderall, a prescription stimulant, I mean, it can be a medication or it can be a drug. It's a medication if a person has been medically evaluated by a professional, has been written a prescription for the, by that professional, and is taking the medication as prescribed. Now, if a person is taking Adderall without a prescription, let's say because they think it's going to help them study for a test, then it's being used as a drug. Remember, drug, health risk, dangerous. Now, a side note. Um, you know, if a person uses Adderall that's not prescribed, yeah, it may help them hyper-focus, but it does not help someone to learn or remember information better, and it has multiple side effects, like being addictive, impairing sleep and appetite, and increasing the likelihood of depressive symptoms. Let me give you another example. Um, my mom had reverse shoulder replacement surgery. She got prescribed oxycodone, which is an opioid for um, acute pain relief. She was directed to take a certain amount and only when she had symptoms of pain and for a limited timeline. She was directed to take the med for a limited timeline. So if she used more than prescribed or beyond that timeline, then she'd be using it as a drug, even though she has a prescription. Now, I make this distinction as sometimes people think, well, if it's a medication, it's safe. And that is far from reality. Um, we, know, we know about the opioid epidemic, and many people have overdosed and even died 
from prescription opioids that came from a doctor because they use them as a drug. And I also want to point out that possessing a prescription that isn't ours, an opioid, a prescription stimulant like Adderall or Concerta, or a prescription benzodiazepine like Xanax or Valium, or giving this kind of prescription to someone else with the, and they don't have a prescription, that that's a considered a felony level drug charge. Um, and we're gonna talk about felony um, later and what, what that means. All drugs, including nicotine and alcohol, nicotine and alcohol are also drugs. All drugs pose health risks and negatively impact the developing brain. Nicotine in the form of e-cigarettes or vapes, marijuana, including marijuana concentrates, and alcohol are the three most commonly misused substances among young people. I'm going to do a deeper dive into each of these substances. Let's talk e-cigarettes. Electronic cigarettes, also known as e-cigarettes, e-cigs, vapes, jewels, sorens, they're battery-operated devices that heat a liquid into an aerosol that the user inhales. The liquid, e-juice or e-liquid, contains propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, flavors, other additives, and in the majority of cases, nicotine. Now, e-cigs have really changed since they came to the U.S. about 15 years ago. They first resembled conventional cigarettes. Then came the, the tanks um, and mods with big plumes of aerosol. And now they've morphed into these sleek gadgets like Jewels and Novos, which look like USB drives, and Sorens, which look like highlighters. This most recent type of e-cig are called pod-based systems. There's a power source and pre-filled pods or cartridges of liquid nicotine or e-juice. Juul currently dominates 70% of the e-cigarette market, but Sorens and Smock, Nords and Novos are becoming more popular. Different from past e-cigs or vapes, current popular pod-based systems like Juul, Sorens and Smock, Novos and Nords all contain nicotine. The amount of nicotine in a Juul pod, for instance, contains the equivalent to the amount of nicotine in one to two packs of cigarettes. The formula in Juuls and other pod-based systems is different than other e-cigs. They use what's called nicotine salt, which is a free base nicotine paired with benzoic acid. I'm sorry, benzoic acid. So the nicotine salt gives, gives users a smoother hit allowing them to use higher concentrations of nicotine um, at a time. And this means they get addicted even stronger and faster. Nicotine impacts the developing brain, affecting learning, memory, attention, impulsivity, and mood. It also primes the brain for future substance use and is incredibly addictive. Students I have worked with report getting nick sick, which is actually overdosing on nicotine nicotine poisoning. It's a very unpleasant experience where a person might get nauseous, throw up, have headache, dizziness, rapid heartbeat, and even faint. There's also an average of about 42 chemicals like formaldehyde, diacetyl, and arsenic in the vapes that are linked to respiratory and lung issues. Last August, we started hearing about what's called what's now called a valley. A valley or e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury um, has about 2,000 cases, over 2,000 cases in the, in the US and, and over 50 people have died from a valley. Now there's a lot we don't know about this, but what we do know is about roughly 89% of cases of a valley report using THC oil or marijuana concentrates. And it's believed that the vitamin E acetate found in the marijuana concentrates is the ingredient that's triggering the Evali. But the CDC and the FDA are still evaluating and investigating this. Um, we'll, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit. So with these health risks and the significant addiction potential, the federal minimum legal sale age for all tobacco products, which includes e-cigarettes, was recently raised from 18 to 21. 
This happened in December 2019. E-cigarettes were meant to be an off-ramp from cigarettes, but the target marketing to youth, the flavors, and the design of the products made them into an on-ramp for those who don't even use cigarettes. Fortunately, there are lots of resources available to help teens quit. And for these resources, please view the document listed, um, listed below this presentation titled CAP Educational Videos and Resources. Let's transition to marijuana. About one third of young people who use e-cigarettes also vape marijuana. Delta 9 THC is the psychoactive ingredient in marijuana, which comes from the cannabis plant, that's believed to be responsible for the high, that relaxed, pleasurable, detached from reality feeling that some users experience. Now, I do want to be clear that there are people that experiment with marijuana that have a very negative reaction, like paranoid and anxiousness, um, even having a panic attack that has landed them in, an, in the ER. The marijuana of today is remarkably different than the marijuana from 10 to 20 years ago. The THC content of marijuana from the 90s was about 3 to 5 percent, where today's, TH, or today's marijuana has a THC content about, of about 15 to 25 percent. And then there's these new products that have hit the market about five years ago or so called dabs or marijuana concentrates. And this is what I was referring to earlier. Um, marijuana concentrates are usually in a form of oil or wax, and they have about 80 to 90% THC. Now, this is the product that's commonly vaporized in e-cigarettes or other vaporizers. When it's vaporized, there's just not much of a smell. I mean, certainly not the skunk smell that traditional leaf marijuana has, which many students call bud. This is, um, this is the product that's been linked to a valley, that lung issue. Now, symptoms of a valley include shortness of breath, chest pain, cough, stomach ache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, and chills. And some with a valley have even needed lung transplants. Now, there are e cigarettes or vaporizers that, like I said, use pre filled pods with either liquid nicotine or marijuana concentrates, and these can be switched in and out of the vape. These products are referred to as dab carts, carts, or vape pens. Now, here's what I want to make known In the state of Minnesota, possession of just 0.25 grams or above of marijuana concentrates or dabs can be a felony level drug possession. Now, because a felony, if we are age 16 or older, is public information, we can be denied jo job and housing opportunities. We can't join the military. We can't vote. We can't own a gun. We're going to be on probation with somebody checking up on us. We can't travel out of state. We could have fines of $1,000 or more. And if we are 18 and have a felony-level drug, drug on us and get caught, um, we might go to jail immediately. Now, I'm just going to give you a quick example. I, I worked with a student. I've changed many details um, to protect his privacy. So this student um, got caught with a cart um, at school. So I uh, had a marijuana concentrate was in the cart. And the police were involved. And it took uh, six, about six months before he ever went to court. So he was waiting with anxiety and stress for six months, not knowing the outcome of this possession. Then he went to court and got um, charged with a felony. He got on probation, had to do an evaluation, a chemical evaluation, follow the recommendations, get r random drug tests where he had to go in and pee in a cup randomly. Uh, he's about eight months into probation, and his probation will likely be about a year. So he went to apply for a job a couple weeks ago at a gas station, and he interviewed really well. And then uh, he was told he didn't get that job. And when asked why, he's, um, the, the 
manager of the gas station said, well, we pulled up your record, we did a background check, and you have a pending felony level drug charge. And he goes, well, it was only marijuana. And they didn't, there wasn't any further conversation. He didn't get the job. Now, I will say if he successfully completes his probation, it's, it's likely that that charge is going to be dropped down to a gross misdemeanor, but that's not known at this point. So whether we agree with the law or not, I just want to impress upon you what the law is and what the ramifications of a felony are. Now, marijuana can be smoked, vaporized, or consumed in the form of edibles like gummies. Vaping marijuana concentrates is linked to that of valley, that lung issue. Well, smoking marijuana, smoking the bud, is linked to chronic cough and bronchitis. Generally speaking, marijuana use during teen years is correlated with decline in IQ points. Regular marijuana use impairs learning, motivation, memory, and, and attention. School is just harder, and we aren't as focused on goals and doing what we need to do to be a productive member of society and having a good quality of life. Marijuana can also impact our quality of sleep, so we tend to get more tired during the day. It interferes with our hunger cues. I mean, I've worked with students who become dependent on marijuana to eat, and when they smoke, and when they don't smoke, they don't want to eat. Regular use doubles the risk of psychosis and schizophrenia um, in those with a genetic predisposition. And nobody really knows if they have a genetic predisposition to schizophrenia or not. And a person can have adverse reactions to marijuana, especially the dabs, which again, 80 to 90% THC, or the edibles where edibles take about 45 minutes to an hour to metabolize. So a person might consume too much and then an hour later it hits them. And these adverse reactions can be having the spins, nausea, throwing up, extreme anxiety, panic attack, and paranoia. And there's been documented ER visits of individuals with these experiences. Now, a myth that I think is not as common anymore, but it's still out there, is that marijuana is not addictive. Now, I'm not saying it's addictive for everybody, but it can be addictive for some. I mean, just like any addictive behavior, right? So let me walk you through a scenario. Let's say I'm having a rough day. My boyfriend and I just got in a fight. I came home after school and I found out my cat ran away. To top it off, my parents are on me for my grades. So I'm venting to my friend and, and she's like, well, you know, I smoke bud and it helps me when I'm stressed out. Do you want to try some? I'll, I'll pick you up right now. And I think to myself, you know, I know I shouldn't. It's illegal. My brain's developing, you know, but you know what? Maybe just once. I'm having a rough day today and I'm stressed. Maybe just this one time. And I try some and I, and I, I do get some relief and I, I temporarily feel more relaxed. But then it wears off, you know, in a couple hours. And then you need to ask yourself, did it, did it solve the fight with my boyfriend? Did it get my grades up? Did it make my cat come back? No. And then what happens when I have another bad day? My brain, that connection has been made where my brain will associate stress with marijuana. And you see where that cycle can start. So when a person uses marijuana, especially in response to stress, they are not learning the coping tools to deal with the normal pressures of life. The current definition of addiction is based on 11 criteria, and we're going to go over those later. But to simplify, um, I explain addiction in terms of the three C's, craving, control, consequence. So craving. Craving happens before a person uses. It's that, it's that urge to use. It feels like an obsession. Um, you know, people think about it, talk about it, schedule their week around it. Loss of control happens after you start using. That means you can't predict 100% how much you're going to have or for how long once you start. That's a sign of addiction. Loss of control. So 
I think of a, a, some students I work with and a, you know, a student will say, yeah, you know, when I first started smoking, I'd go out to my shed and use a one um, come back and then go about my night. Um, now he said, I go out to the shed and my intention is just to have that one but sometimes it turns into a bowl, you know, and, and sometimes it even turns into, Hey, I, I have that one now I'm going to invite friends over for a smoke sesh. And then he doesn't, and then his whole night is, is, is shot. And then there's the consequences, the third C. Um, and that means there's consequences from the use. It's affecting other areas of life. Now, I'm fortunate where I can develop relationships with students where they come, get to a place of, of after some reflection and they say, yeah, I am addicted to marijuana. And then they'll say, but my friend tells me I can't get addicted. And so why I'm spending time on this is that it's stigmatizing to these students when they hear from their peers, it's not addictive. And when we perpetuate this message, it actually creates barriers for those experiencing problems with their use to get the help they need. Now, again, I am not saying everyone who uses marijuana will develop an addiction or what's called a cannabis use disorder. But what I will say is that we don't know who will and who won't if they use and that adolescents are just at a greater risk of developing that addiction than if they were to delay the use. And of course, like I had talked about earlier, addiction is not the only risk of marijuana use. So now on to alcohol. Well, all substances have health risks. Tobacco and alcohol are the two substances that kill the most Americans per year. I mean, more than opioids. Tobacco is the leading cause of preventable death. And when I say tobacco, I mean conventional cigarettes. Well, alcohol is third. Um, some people are surprised to learn what counts as a drink. In the US, one standard drink contains about 14 grams, 0.6 fluid ounces of pure alcohol, which that amount is found in 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, and 1.5 ounces of distilled spirits, tequila, gin, vodka, whiskey, rum. And there are adults that can, that use, there's many adults that can use in a, in a low risk way. Um, and I'm talking, you know, one to two standard drinks in a sitting as the body metabolizes about one drink an hour. However, teenagers do not consume alcohol in this way. Most teenagers, great majority of teenagers. Um, teenagers have a different sensitivity and tolerance to alcohol because of their brain still developing, meaning that when they do drink, they tend to binge drink. And binge drink means about four or more standard drinks in a sitting. Alcohol use impairs judgment and slows reaction time. People experience um, a loss of inhibition and coordination, which can lead to injuries, unprotected sex, car crashes, and fights. And too much alcohol can cause blackouts where a person is up and functioning, but they have zero memory of what they said or did. Alcohol use, especially binge drinking, can lead to alcohol poisoning or alcohol overdose. And this occurs when there is so much alcohol in the bloodstream that areas of the brain controlling basic life support functions, such as breathing, heart rate, and temperature control, begin to shut down. Symptoms of alcohol overdose include mental confusion, difficulty remaining conscious, vomiting, trouble breathing, seizure, slow heart rate, clammy skin, dulled responses such as a gag, such as no gag reflex, and extremely low body temperature. It's important to know the signs. So if you are ever in a position where these signs are occurring, you call 911 immediately. Some people will give the person cold showers or try to make them drink coffee, and this just doesn't work. Stay with the person until help arrives. Try to have them sit up if possible, but if they are too incapacitated, roll them over on their side to prevent possible choking on their vomit. Now, 
This brings me to the Good Samaritan Law. The Good Samaritan Law in Minnesota places a legal duty on people to provide assistance to others who are in danger of physical harm. So that means if you are in the presence of someone who is exhibiting signs of an alcohol overdose or any drug overdose for that matter, and you don't call for help, you could get charged with a petty misdemeanor. So here's what I also want you to know. There is an immunity clause, and this means that the person needing help or the person who called for help will have no legal consequences even if they have been engaging in drug use when they call for help or have possession of drugs or paraphernalia on them at the time. If the person who calls for help or the overdose victim are currently on probation, these programs will not be affected by seeking out emergency assistance for an overdose. A topic that could be a whole separate presentation is the risk of alcohol and driving. I mean, really the danger of any drug use and driving. That's a, an awful combination. For instance, driving after using marijuana is dangerous and it slows reaction time and interferes with the ability to multitask, which are just critical for driving. The CAP educational video and resources page talks about some of the laws around driving under the influence and the associated dangers. That resource page also has links to other information about the health risks of other substances such as opioids, and I really invite you to review that. It's important to be aware of the risks of these other substances, um, even though the rates of use among youth significantly decline after nicotine, alcohol, and marijuana. Now, I also want to point something else out. Um, you know, among young people and adults, it's common that people think that more people use than actually use. There's a perception out there that, well, everyone does it. And I just want to point out to you that the majority of youth don't use substances. You know, we look at e-cigarettes. So in Washington County, 33% of 11th graders, approximately 33, um, have used an e-cigarette at least once in the last 30 days. So that means 67% did not. Marijuana, we're talking uh, average, 19% of 11th graders have used marijuana at least once in the last 30 days. That means 81% didn't. That's a great majority. Um, and if you're sitting here thinking, well, where does she get her numbers? Um, I will say the source is the Minnesota Student Survey, and it has been deemed by the Minnesota Department of Education and the Minnesota Department of Health as a reliable and valid data source. It's not like, uh, it, you know, and I will say too, you know, the use rates in Minnesota are fairly on par with the nation. So it's not like every, you know, in Minnesota, we're calling people in Alabama and Maine and Washington and saying, hey, how are you answering this question? So it's been shown to be reliable. Now, again, you might be thinking, well, I just don't believe her, even though she says it's valid and reliable. <laughs> well, here's something to think about. You know, people typically don't talk about how sober they got over the weekend. Um, people don't, talk about what they didn't do. So the noise we hear in the hallways is about the parties. It, the, you know, we're, we're probably not going to hear, hey, I went to the apple orchard with my mom this weekend. You know, people too, are, they're not posting TikTok or Snap videos where the focus of the video is, hey, here's a video of myself talking about how I don't smoke bud and I never will. Or here's a video of, hey, I was offered a vape and I said no. So it's the videos are maybe of the people vaping or smoking or drinking. So, you know, I just point this out, not to shame anybody, but to recognize that if we choose not to use, we're in the majority. And there's a lot of people, other people out there that don't use as well. Before I close, I want to revisit addiction. The American Medical Association first classified addiction as a medical condition in 1954. Now the definition of, of addiction has changed over the years. 
And currently, addiction, which the medical term is substance use disorder, is defined as mild, moderate, or severe, and it's based on the number of 11 diagnostic criteria met by an individual. So for instance, if a person meets six or more of the diagnostic criteria because of their marijuana use, they would be classified or they would be diagnosed with a severe cannabis use disorder. An addiction to alcohol would be an alcohol use disorder, opioid, opioid alcohol, uh, sorry, opioid use disorder, nicotine use disorder, stimulant use disorder, nic um, you get the picture. So the criteria listed here, again, there's 11, um, is, is the 11 criteria. And like I said earlier, you know, just to break it down, you can think of addiction as the three C's, craving, loss of control, consequence. And again, um, this is the criteria used to assess and diagnose substance use disorder. Now, science and technology so far have not given us the ability to predict who will and who won't develop a substance use disorder if they start using. As with other diseases and medical conditions, there's risk factors and protective factors. Risk factors are those that increase one's risk of developing a substance use disorder. Protective factors being the inverse, factors that protect one against that disorder. So if you only remember one thing from this presentation, remember this. All factors aside, the biggest predictor of developing an addiction, a substance use disorder, is age of first use. It's more than genetics, everything combined. So the younger a person starts, their risk of developing lifelong problems with that substance goes up dramatically. So again, the surefire way to prevent addiction is not to use, it's to abstain. However, delaying that use three months, one year, two years, until we're age 25, <laughs> Um, that reduces our risk of developing an addiction. Mental health is another risk factor. About 60 to 80% of adolescents who are abusing substances also show symptoms of mental health disorders like depression or anxiety. I mean, let's just be real. People don't use substances on a regular basis because their life is going awesome. So protective factor, again, those things that protect us from developing that substance use disorder, doesn't necessarily prevent, but it, it increases our protection, is having healthy ways to cope with stress and other emotions. A website that I would encourage everybody to go on, every teen, is, to, um, is Change to Chill. It's a website with tools and resources to help teens manage stress. And all the content was developed by teenagers. So that's a protective factor. A question I get a lot from parents is, you know, Julia, my kid's smoking weed. And do you think this is just a poor choice? Or are they addicted? Do they have an addiction to this? Now, I got to be real. It's difficult to know, right, when that line is crossed. And I go back to those 11 criteria that I showed you. I often have people, have young people look at the criteria and evaluate themselves. You know, what do you relate to in this list? Something that I, I would encourage that if, you know, if you're a young person and you are using, um, and it's not an isolated incident, it's not just experimentation, I would really encourage you to get formally evaluated. Get a substance use assessment to better understand where you're at with all this. It's just, it's just information gathering so you know more about you. And mental health is also explored in that assessment. Please call YSB for more information about a substance use assessment. Now, at the end of the day, whether it's an unhealthy choice or it's a substance use disorder, it's, a, it's important we approach this as a health and safety issue rather than a moral issue. Got to take those emotions out of it, as hard as that is, because we're scared, we're worried, we remain calm, and we listen. 
we listen to each other's perspective. And I'm talking about you young people listening to your parents with an open mind. And we listen to understand versus listen to reply. Now we're nearing the end of this presentation and remember to review the CAP educational video and resources document for the other answers to this quiz. Like I said, I hope that the learning, the reflection and the growth go far beyond this class and that you, you both, you, uh, the young people and their parent or other caring adult, continue the conversation about substance use and mental health. And we are help, here to help you continue that conversation. So as a chemical health specialist in Stillwater Schools, my primary role is counseling. I provide students a safe, judgmental space, judgmental free, <laughs> no judgment, um, space to explore their use especially what's driving the use. And I, I work to empower that young person to make healthier just, just choices. Here's what I often say to students. You know, my goal with young people, here's my goal, it's twofold. First, it's to help them be the best versions of themselves. And second, it's to help them get to a place where they look at themselves in the mirror and they like the person looking back at them. And my 13 years of experience has told me that substance use is, is almost always not compatible with being the best versions of us and truly loving who we are. So now it's your turn. This is your opportunity to learn, reflect, and grow so that you can come out the other side of this all a better version of you. And you don't have to do this alone. Thank you for your attention to this presentation, and I hope you're staying safe and healthy.